Dear colleagues and guests, how do you hear me? Well, thanks. So we're moving to the next panel. Um, I'm wanted to chair it and let me uh, present uh, three lectures. Uh, they are Katerina Malachova uh, from uh, Rihori Skovoroda Institute of Philosophy, National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, Ukraine. Uh, Isaac Mortsahi Slater, University of Hamburg, Germany. And Rachel Manikin, University of Maryland, United States. Um, it seems uh, Rachel will join us a bit later. So we move to the first uh, presentation uh, by Katerina Malachova, Rabbi Nachman as a reader of Muscovite literature. Right, thank you, Vitaly. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear my teachers, uh, can you hear me well, by the way? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that's a great honor for me to uh, give my presentation here in that auditory. Um, uh, I'm happy so much that the people, uh, books by whom I have read uh, in my uh, student years and now uh, are here. Uh, my presentation is dedicated to Rabbi Nachman as a reader of Muscalic literature. Uh, I will uh, start with sharing my screen, just a moment. Oh, uh -huh. just a moment now, hope it is okay. I'll do it as a full screen. Uh-huh, it is okay now, I hope. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, ah, yes, let me beg your pardon for my English. It is too uh, slow and uh, mistakes can happen. So <laughs> please don't pay attention on that. I, uh, I'm doing my best. Uh, so, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov as a, as a reader of Muscalic literature. I will um, start noting that uh, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and his circle is um, widely um, accepted as one of the focuses, one of the leaders of Hasidic uh, anti muscalic polemics. And it is clearly seen reading uh, texts, uh, especially by Rabbi Natan uh, of Nemirov. And uh, mm, there are a lot of uh, brilliant scholars who studied uh, that phenomenon, starting from the uh, article on uh, uh, Rabbi Nachman on the Umen er Maskilim and uh, the works of Weiss, works of Piekush, and later brilliant works of uh, Marcin Wadzinski, uh, uh, brilliant art article dedicated to the topic by uh, Feiner. I will not go deep into the historiography of the problem. Uh, I um, ask uh, everyone interested uh, to turn to these uh, works. Uh, so the focus of the problem is that, as we know, uh, in writings of uh, Rabbi Nachman and especially Rabbi Natan, we can find uh, lots of indications that muscalic literature is generally prohibited for reading for students. It is dangerous. Uh, and uh, no one uh, uh, must put his soul in danger reading uh, those uh, um, uh, the books of those uh, Epicurean. On the other hand, as we know, as it is uh, described by scholars, uh, the same texts uh, includes uh, include lots of mentions that. Uh, Sadik of the generation, or uh, as we should understand it, Rabbi Nachman itself, actually has a right of reading these texts, using them in order to know his enemy in the face. Uh, 
one of my first examples, one of the first uh, texts I want to start with, is a brilliant, a brilliant example uh, given by uh, Mandel Piekas um, in his work on Brief of Hasidism. He, uh, uh, he gives a quotation from Chaye Moharan, which says, uh, that means the knowledge uh, brought by Haskala. Uh, that means the knowledge uh, brought by Haskala. Uh, uh, and Piekas notes that uh, this uh, uh, this thing, which is uh, uh, is uh, uh, clearly uh, um, uh, negative to uh, masculine uh, knowledge and their usage, is itself built on the quotation from masculine book, which is Sefer Abrit, uh, uh, kind of first uh, masculine encyclopedia, the book with uncertain status between uh, masculine and uh, rabbinical literature. A brilliant book which was published at the very uh, end of 18th century by uh, Pinchas Eliyahu Gurwitz from Vilna. So this book um, cont uh, contains lots of knowledge about uh, development of European science for that time. Uh, it is presented by author as um, uh, in the way it is acceptable to the reader. So Piekas noted that uh, the very fact uh, on which the saying of uh, Rabbi Nachman is built is taken from that book. You can compare uh, it here. Uh, it is Sefer Brit, Halek Aleph, Ktav Yosher Mamar Eser, Mekriot Mosdei Tevel. Kizay karov le 50 shana yim tziyo chacham echad mina chachamim, kri gershmo, mod barzel, matzil et beitim mina barak veram. Ulam Shem Haishli Rashona, Harsha Him Tsize, Kamashanim Kodam Krieger, and Iskar Zibultus Zibultus Mug, who he dash medatora shit Hochmazo, who Masar Nafsho Eleven Herag Metal Yadeha Barak Veran. So, as we can see, uh, this attitude to uh, some kind of uh, some, uh, some books from masculine literature uh, allows Rabbi Nachman at the same way prohibit this kind of new knowledge and to use it at the same time. Uh, so the question arises, uh, to which extent Rabbi Nachman and his circle really used these masculine books? Uh, how, do they use the, how do they use uh, these books? Did, they, uh, include, did they, their text include the quotations from this book and if yeah, from these books, this literature? And if yes, uh, what is the politics of Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Natan towards these texts? Do they use it as a way of um, um, supporting their own arguments, or it is a polemical usage? Uh, how do they name this text? Do they refer to this text or, uh, or not? So that was the start of my uh, small research. Uh, I raised the question, uh, what do we really know about <clears throat> cases of uh, quotation by Rabbi Nachman and his circle from early masculine literature. Uh, <clears throat> recently, uh, I need to say that uh, both Mendel Piekas and Honesh Meruk and other scholars <clears throat> uh, noted some cases from this, um, from this range. And uh, we have some three pages by Piekas dedicated to that. And we have some couple of pages by Honesh Meruk. And we have some art article by uh, Schmulfeiner. Uh, recently, like a month ago, uh, a Breslover Hasid uh, called uh, Shmuel Avram Tfilinski, he's not a researcher, he's a Breslover, Breslover Hasid, uh, compiled a list of uh, 33 cases of quotations in early Breslavic lit literature from Sefer Brit, as he, uh, as he found them. He was basing uh, mainly on Breslover sources, uh, uh, mm, 
Parme Kdoshim edition of Likutei Moharan and one more edition of Likutei Moharan, Hatakat Mahadurat Moharanat, printed recently. And uh, basically, most of the cases were noted by Breslover commentators. commentators. So what I have done, I have gathered all these cases, added some cases from uh, um, research uh, literature, and uh, some new cases were found during that work. So the idea was to see what is the politics of Breslover texts towards these uh, uh, pieces of information used in uh, Breslover uh, literature. Uh, the first question which I uh, asked myself is a way of referencing. We know that uh, rabbinical literature uh, <clears throat> does not usually uh, name the author of the text uh, uh, the rabbinical authors uh, use. So the question is, how do these uh, Breslover authors name this text? And among all these 40 and something cases, what I have found that 17 cases have no reference. But inside this group of uh, no reference quotation, uh, there are uh, some uh, specific citations. For example, four, uh, four uh, cases insert this knowledge taken from uh, uh, Moscow literature. Mainly, we are speaking about Sefer Abrid because among these 47 cases, 45 are from Sefer Abrid and only three are from Ozer Israel by Moshe Marcuse. So we should understand that this list is far from being full. Uh, so, uh, four cases introduce this taken uh, knowledge from separate literature uh, using uh, formula ki ikar. Ki ikar ko hareut hu, ki ikar hu shashmiya hu, vken ikar hamimut yisod haesh, blah, blah, blah. Ki dofek bamen neshama, ikar had saraba lev hu. After that, we can find in this text a piece of uh, information. Uh, taken from Sefer Brit. One more way is uh, to uh, use uh, the formula Nidbarer uh, Bachush or Mevoar Begashmiot, which refers to the situation when the, uh, Rabbi Nachman or Rabbi Natan in that case uh, understands uh, the uh, information he uses as information which is coming from feeling. Uh, putting aside the fact that he has uh, is that he had read about that in the Muscovite book. Uh, other cases are uh, we have two references, uh, Besfarim, not indicating which Sfarim. We have five uh, cases, Mechkarim, Kemuvar uh, Etzel Mechkarim. And this is a regular usage of Mechkarim in uh, Muscovite literature also. And we have, uh, uh, we have two cases of Chachmei uh, Yisudot Refua. I mean, the station when the book cited is marked as uh, not a general Mechkarim, but as Chachmei uh, Yisudot uh, or Chachmei Refua or uh, other uh, sciences. And only in two cases I have found uh, a situation when the specific book is mentioned, but at the same time, this book is not named. So generally, they prefer uh, to refer to uh, this uh, uh, to this book. In this case, we are speaking mainly about Sefer Brit as Mechkarim, uh, Besfarim, and uh, there are cases when there is no reference at all. So what we what what can we conclude conclude from that? First, I have uh, I don't uh, have found. Purative references, no words like a pekorsim or minim or something like that. Still, there are uh, no direct references. And if we are trying to distinguish between politics of Rabbi Nachman and of Rabbi Natan, so we, we find that in all uh, cases which I have, Rabbi Nachman prefers the form mevoar besfarim or mevoar etzel mechkarim. In all cases, and Rabbi Nachman uses different ways, but uh, uh, mainly uh, no reference form using the, uh, the formulas ki ikar or kan Rabbi Hush. Now, what is the problem with uh, uh, with that references? Usually, what, what does uh, this reference show? They can say us something about attitude towards these books, but the methodological problem arising here is what is 
the real object of reference. We understand this, that this knowledge, like the knowledge about, uh, uh, about a scientist who invented uh, the instrument uh, uh, against uh, uh, lightning, right? It has its orig original sources somewhere in European literature, in German or Latin or French, anyway, not in Hebrew. Then it goes through a row of intermediate sources. Uh, then it gets to the closest source for our reader, uh, in that case, it is separate. And after that, Rabbi Nachman quotes uh, or uses the information from his closest source. So when he is uh, referencing to something, it is still the question what he is referencing to, who is uh, uh, who is the named person or persons, author of separate or uh, uh, scientists which are cited in their term in separate. Like in that example, uh, Rabbi Nachman cites some information, noting ki ikar hu, so that means without reference, but Sefrabrit uh, uh, indicates that achronim uh, uh, optik. The next case shows the problem more, uh, more uh, clearly. Uh, when Rabbi Nachman, Omer, uh, 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 there is a question who he means by again, author of Sefrabrit or uh, the sources on which Sefrabrit is based. And uh, if we open Sefrabrit, we can find that uh, there, the name of the uh, scientist is indicated. Uh, because, uh, and all that, Rabbi Nachman indicates as Chachmei Yisadot. So, uh, no uh, direct uh, conclusions can be derived from uh, these uh, words themselves, because we don't know in each case what is uh, the meaning, or the meaning is Sefer Habrit, or other sorts cites, cited in Sefer Habrit. However, it indicates some uh, attitude to uh, that uh, type of literature. Uh, now, whether uh, Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nathan agree with the uh, information, with uh, the arguments they uh, derive from uh, Sefer Brit and other Maskelet books. So from the cases I have analyzed, 44 cases use that as argument supporting author's idea. And only in three cases, it was a polemic use, which is very strange because uh, we used to uh, think that uh, if uh, Breslov literature uses some masculine ideas, uh, it is a polemical use. But this shows that uh, it is not the case. And I, uh, maybe I will try to explain that by uh, a quotation from uh, Hayim Mohran, by idea expressed in Hayim Mohran, also uh, given by Pietas. Uh, when Rabbi Nachman tells us, uh, 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 Rabbi Nathan tells us, uh, sorry, uh, that Rabbi Nachman Hayemit would say it's meod, but Masha Katab Sham, and uh, this is reference to Sefer Brit. Min Yan Haumrim, Lin Yan Kabbalat Torah, Shenatan, with the help of Tachbulot Bechachmato, that Moshe Rabbeinu gave us the Torah with the help of some instruments with Tachbulot. And he's, he's saying, the Asur Lazor Varim Kaelo, Filo Derechlitz, and Utrahman, and Slan Rahman, and Le Shazwan. I'm even not saying that this is also a quotation from Sefer Abrit, and he refers to the chapter about uh, Moshe in Sefer Abrit, which in it, uh, in it turn cites uh, uh, Spinoza about, uh, about Moses. But uh, he wrote here that. Which can mean that if the author is not agree with that idea, he will not cite it. He will not, uh, he will not bring it to his text. So the, this can explain why uh, the picture is like that, that the uh, ideas cited are used mainly as a supporting ideas and not for polemics. Uh, now the question which which topics are addressed more? And here, uh, the picture is, I would say, predictable. Uh, from all cases, uh, 17 mentions are uh, about physics. 
and we can see a variety of uh, subjects which uh, interested so much uh, Bresselver authors. The Earth have a force of gravity. Uh, the sun shines with equal strength at morning and in day, but uh, the globe blocks the sun's light. Uh, nature of movement is to generate, to generate warmth. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, a night lights, uh, which uh, are near the ground, uh, which disappear when you approach. Uh, a vapors, uh, a breath, a candle, which light, uh, a candle which can be, um, um, which can be lightened up with uh, bringing it closer to other candle and other stuff like that. Uh, the next group, which is smaller, is uh, physiology and medicine. Uh, and uh, still it has uh, some six, uh, seven mentions. Uh, and the topics which were interesting to Breslover authors were where pools does come from, uh, how the <clears throat> how the site is constructed, how it works, how we listen, uh, how our nutrition works, what is the saliva, how it works, and so on. And uh, the smallest group uh, connected to uh, beliefs, to faith, uh, to theology, and to philosophy. And this is the most interesting group. Uh, it's uh, so pity that we have no time enough to get into the each example because each of them uh, is uh, very specific and very interesting. Uh, it's a mentions about uh, uh, false Baal Shems who, who are called Tatars. Uh, it is a, a mentions about um, uh, from where the science of nature come from, from Jews or from people uh, or, or from other nations uh, uh, and so on. So we can see that the main topics are physics and physiology. Uh, and uh, actually, Rabbi Nachman uh, uses more these types of topics uh, to take to his texts. And uh, in the texts uh, by Rabbi Nathan, we find a wider range, including theology, including beliefs, including uh, uh, sciences and uh, faith. What, what does it tell us? I think that. Uh, well, it was, predict it was predictable, but it's still important to understand that uh, it shows us that the physics, knowledge about physical world, uh, is so-called a uh, horse of Troya. It is a way uh, through which this new knowledge uh, has, uh, um, can enter the Breslover discourse. And this is connected mainly to these topics and not to theology and not to other uh, ideas which are understood as problematic themselves. Uh, well, now the question, the next question is what Rabbi Nachman is doing with this text? How do he use it in his own teachings? And uh, let me show you one of the examples, Lipte Maharan 113. Uh, uh, the chapter dedicated to the uh, uh, to the scene, to the uh, way uh, the people can see. Mm. First, let us compare two texts, Elikutei uh, Maharan and the source in uh, Sefer Abrit. Elikutei Maharan indicates, Ki ikar kua harout, mechemad she maka bedavar she nira, bedavar ha nira, vechuzer ha kua harout, mechemad haka aleinaim, venit stayer ha davar ha nira. Aval, uh, שהדבר נראה הוא רחוק, אז קודם שיגיע uh, כוח לראות הדבר הנראה, מתפזר בתוך האוויר ונתעקר, ואין מגיע בהכאה אל הדבר, ועל ידי זה אין חוזר הרעות לעיניי. Uh, this chapter is clearly based on Sefer Brit, and we can see here the source. Uh, אולם uh, האחרונים, כותב רבי פנחס גורביץ, uh, האחרונים מכתבי אופטיק, מחכמי אופטיק, העמיקו יותר בדבר זה, והם אמרו שהאור אם הגיעותו עצם דק מאוד הוא גשם, מהיר בתנועתו והוא רץ ונמהר מאוד, לכן יופל ויסעו בחור בפגעתו בגשם, כמו אבן הנזרק בכוח מול הכותל, ברצו ושוב מן הכותל, וכאשר יפגוש בחזרתו עין הרואה, דרך נקבי הפורס אשר בעין, ואז ירגיש העין ויתמונה. 
how does Rabbi Nachman use this very important knowledge which he uh, have taken from uh, Sefra Brit. Uh, this part of the teaching is dedicated to uh, um, to the uh, divine providence, which is uh, um, uh, which uh, uh, under which uh, are both Israel people and people of the nations. Uh, and Rabbi Nachman tells us. Uh, now he uses this information. Uh, uh, and uh, he continues and uh, tells that if uh, the object seen is far from the scene, so uh, the eye cannot receive it. Uh, and then he provides his interpretation of it. He, sa he says that uh, the sight of the God has the same nature. Sorry, that the sight of the good has the same nature. Uh, he uses uh, the verse Hachayot uh, Ratsuvashu, the Omer that these particles which, uh, by which the sight is working, uh, 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 it is Torah. And Ratsu, it is God's sight from above, and Shuv, it it is reflecting uh, the particles back. So uh, if, uh, uh, if, the, uh, if um, uh, the righteous uh, person uh, brings uh, people to the Torah, he uh, makes the side of God working. He makes the, the, the divine providence working. And if object is too far from the eye, the particles cannot return back. And this is the cause why divine providence reaches the nations only partially, only on the way to and not on the way on their their way um, back. Uh, so what can we see here? That Rabbi Nachman takes some uh, nature law or pattern through which the nature works, and he uh, reads through it. Uh, his um, uh, he, he disperses it to the uh, his sp uh, spiritual ideas, and he explains by it his spiritual ideas. So he creates a new uh, images and new imagery which can explain uh, uh, his ideas. Here is one more example. Uh, sorry. Uh, here it is, one more uh, teaching from Lekutei Maharan, uh, also based on Seferabrit. Uh, in Seferabrit, uh, uh, Pinchas Gurwitz, Gurwitz explains how the dew, uh, uh, from where the dew came from, uh, when moisture evaporates from the surface uh, of the earth of water, uh, some of it rises up and falls as a rain, and some dissipates as particles and falls as a dew. And uh, there are those for, for whom this dew is useful, and uh, some uh, for some uh, it is harmful. Uh, Rabbi Nachman starts his teaching. Uh, so the problem he's interested in is the difference between people who can study Torah Lashem Shamayim, people who can study Torah, who cannot study Torah Lashem Shamayim, Lashem Shinato. Uh, but still they study Torah. So he starts that Dash Yesh Mtsai Vihishina, Shehi Mtsai Ben Adam U Ben Hashem in Baraki Vihul, Vyadosh Yesh Hiluk Ben Limudator Lashem Shamayim, Lashem Shina, Vihiluk V Limudator Shem Lo Lashem Shamayim. Uh, and the question is uh, what to do with, the, with those teachings which are not Lashem Shamayim, which cannot uh, be raised uh, directly. And he uses this uh, idea taken from Sefer Abrit. Uh, uh, that means that the frost came. When it was in Bavir, uh, uh, that means that he, he 
pictures uh, this way of studying Torah as uh, coming uh, as a difference between uh, rain and a dew. A rain uh, falls from the heavens themselves, and dew is coming from uh, the teachings who cannot rise so high, so they disperse in the, uh, in the uh, um, atmosphere and uh, still come to the people. Um, so we can see a bit how it works, and the important in this teaching is Rabbi Natan's note, which is provided after the text. Uh, Rabbi Natan uh, tells us, uh, which shows us a bit an attitude uh, uh, of Rabbi Nachman to this uh, idea of using uh, a knowledge taken from um, masculine books. He would like to tell the same idea with the help of uh, uh, Mikra, with the help of uh, Mama Raboteno. But he cannot, and he tries to search the relevant uh, ideas and or the relevant uh, biblical verses or uh, Kabbalistic quotations, which can show the same idea, but he tells that he cannot still. So he is obliged to use this masculine idea. So he feels that he needs, but he cannot. And he, uh, he feels that he still, that this idea is still so important that he use it. Um, uh, well, what can be a conclusions from uh, some examples we uh, had the time to see here? So first, I can see no new ideas or concepts seem to be derived from the side texts. Rabbi Nachman does not uh, uh, receive an idea, the conceptions of Haskalah. And it is clearly seen when we analyze the way he uses the texts, the way he makes a quotation. He, omitted, he is omitting all the details connected to the methodology of Moscalic knowledge. Who had gained this knowledge? By which experiment? With the help of which knowledge? With the help of, with the help of which ideas? All these details are not important for him. And uh, that means that uh, no idea of new science uh, was derived from there. But uh, Rabbi Nachman perceives a new knowledge of the physical world as a truth. And we can see it if we will uh, go back to the way of referencing. Rabbi Nachman does not, uh, does not uh, make a, um, um, a distinction. He, um, he does not uh, mark these texts as mechkarim or svarim. He just starts that ki ikar hadavar hu, and continues with a, a piece of information taken from uh, the Brit. So um, uh, it shows, and yes, and the other way of citing is that he uh, receives it as information which we gain from our physical feelings, which also is a way of uh, a way of gaining the truth about the physical world. So uh, this new knowledge of physical world is not problematic for him, and he is ready to receive it as it is, as, as he receives it from, uh, let's say, from Sefrabrit. Then he spreads, what, what does he do? He spreads the facts and the patterns of the physical world he has learned to spiritual realities, and he uses it to build his teachings. And in some cases, he seems to be so inspired by this new picture of physical world that it influences an imagery of his texts. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, he is inspired to that extent that uh, we can see that even some chapters of Likutei Moharan uh, are uh, the structure of uh, some part of Likutei Moharan are going according, uh, according to the structure of uh, some part of Sefer Brit. So we can see uh, that uh, Lipte Maran starting from uh, 130s, 150s until 170s, uh, teaching, uh, teachings number 150s, 170s, are, have in a kind of a hypertext, uh, chapters of Sefer Brit de dedicated to the elements, uh, starting from uh, the earth, and then about the fire, then about Mikriot uh, Mosdei Tevel, about geography, and then about, uh, uh, it is called the Da'at Varuch, about physiology of uh, the man. 
so these con conclusions are definitely not full. And what should be done next uh, in order to uh, get some real results from this research? First, the list which I was based on is not full. That's clear. We will find much more cases of uh, direct or indirect, uh, mostly indirect quotations from muscular, muscular, uh, from muscular groups, and they will provide us a new knowledge. Uh, then, uh, uh, when this information will be, uh, uh, when uh, when we will know more about different books which were cited or used by Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nathan, it would be possible to distinguish the politics towards different books. Because it's clear the situation of Sefer Abrit can be different from, let's say, Ozer Israel by Marcuse, from Leifin, if, if it is cited from uh, other books, if they are cited also. And uh, when the information will be more wide, uh, the interesting conclusions can be made uh, using this uh, differentiation. One more question which uh, should be done is a distinguishing between politics towards these books by Rabbi Nachman and by Rabbi Natan. So it's clear, thank you to Feiner, that uh, they had the different ideas about that. And uh, it is also the question for the next research. And uh, finally, uh, there is a problem about uh, Yiddish sources in all that story, in all that picture. Whether Yiddish books were part of so-called Maskelip Library of Rabbi Nachman. Uh, there are uh, reasons to think that, yes, actually, Ozer Israel is a Yiddish book. Uh, a Yiddish book. And there are research showing that uh, the influence of uh, Yiddish uh, literature is much more uh, important than it was thought before. But uh, judging by uh, the things I uh, had time to see, uh, my last conclusion or my last idea to discuss is, can we read Rabbi Nachman of Breslov as a kind of mystical interpretation of new knowledge brought by Haskalah? Or in other words, can we accept Rabbi Nachman as a specific type of maskil, of mystical, uh, muscular author, whose, uh, one of whose ideas is to build his uh, huge mystical imagery on this new, no new knowledge about physical world brought for him by at least Sefer Abrit and probably other books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katya. For, for your amazing presentation uh but i'm afraid i'm afraid we have no questions or comments yet <laughs> that's good <laughs> <laughs> so dear colleagues is anyone is there anyone wishing to to ask a question yeah Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask a, a, a starter's question. How do you how do you start such a research? How do you identify a, a, a passage and you want to look it up? Because that would allow us to uh, enrich the the corpus, right? You talk uh, mainly about Sefer Abrit. If I understand how you have, how you recognize passages, that's I, I mean that's amazing to me that. This philological work is, is is very enriching, very important. I'm just wondering how it starts. I'm not uh, I'm not challenging the the conclusion. You know. What I mean? Thank you very very much. That's the most important question because the methodology is our all. <laughs> we all start from methodology. So uh, yes. Yeah, so first, I was based on the research made before. Uh, so I started from some list which I which I had already got. Uh, and uh, I checked it by comparing, uh, first, by comparing these uh, uh, parts of texts, I mean, the chapter from Sefer Abrit and a uh, chapter from Rabbi Nachman. And there were some ways to check it. So first, there are some uh, key words. If Rabbi Nachman by chance uses some German word or some name, which is very rare, so we have a hint. If we don't have a, if we don't have a hint, we have like um, uh, amount of key words together. I mean, if he touches different topics at the same sequence as it is at, at the same chapter within the same four or five uh, or 10 rows in Sefer Abrit, it, it is highly likely that it is from there. Then I have checked whether he had some other, uh, other source, let's say from earlier literature. 
And that was done just by, uh, by search by text uh, with the same keywords. Uh, and uh, uh, I understand that this search is not uh, is highly problematic because uh, actually we don't have uh, digitalized most of uh, relevant masculine books. So uh, there is a still a big question if Rabinathan had probably could have some other source. Uh, but mainly, yes, by, by keywords. And uh, if I have some candidate for, uh, from uh, Sefer Abrit, to uh, to compare, I compare, and in the list I have, there were situations when I decided that uh, that it is not likely to be the source. Uh, but most of them, they, as far as I know, for now, they are likely to be the, the main source. Uh, and concerning the way how to expand this um, uh, uh, corpus, I hoped that the way of referencing would help me. But uh, but now uh, now we say that it is uh, it is not helpful so much because uh, Sparim and Mekarim we need to check if all Sparim and Mekarim refer to exactly Sefer Brit or to exactly Moscelic literature or it can be used to other literature also. And uh, well, the formula key is uh, the, the most beloved Rabinachon's formula, so it, it was used in lots of cases. Of course, not only in that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. More questions? No? Katya, thank you very much again. Not at all. I was hoping for a bit of discussion because Rabbi Nachman is a Moscilic writer, is a rather controversial idea, and I'm not sure I agree with it by myself. Uh, but thank you very much, and uh, probably there will be some comments after. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move to, to the second presentation uh, by Sahi Slater, Doubt, Anti-Clericalism and Heresy, Revealing the Secret World of Soviet Ukrainian Rabbis. Please, Sahi. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you can see me, right? Right, OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Vitaly, I'm very excited to be here in beautiful Lvov and be here as part of the of the beautiful conference. I'll share my sp my screen, um, and of course, thank you for all, for organizing that, uh, Vitaly. This beautiful uh, this beautiful conference. So, the subject of this lecture is Jewish theology and religious philosophy in the early Soviet Union especially during the, uh, the 1920s. You can see my, you can see my uh, PowerPoint, right? Okay. This is a unique period. The, the early Soviet Union is a unique period of, in Jewish history, a time and place where one Jewish culture, the rabbinic culture, was, brutal, was brutally oppressed, while uh, well, another new Jewish culture, the Soviet Yiddish culture, uh, Thrived, driven by the excitement of a new dawn of Jewish life. Both, both, of the, both of them will eventually suffer at the hand of the authorities, not before that, that, not before that they battled each other in a kultur camp that erupted when synagogues turned into theaters and cloisin turned into workers' club. We have plenty of studies describing these political and social developments of the early Soviet Union, what I want to do today is to examine theology and religious philosophy formul formulated during these years, a subject rarely discussed in scholarship. Uh, the reason I find this issue important beyond, of course, that I'm a scholar of Jewish thought, is that religious philosophy is the language by which rabbinic scholars are interpreting the world. In times of such crisis, of such a breakdown of traditional everyday life, we can see fascinating questions being asked and unconventional answers being given. Today I want to share some examples, a little taste of the potential of this unexplored landscape. The other thing I want to do is to undermine some harsh dichotomies. You see, some depictions of religious life in the Soviet Union are stained by a heroic narrative, and in some regards, rightly so. Considering how dangerous it was to uphold religious costumes, it certainly took some bravery to do so. But the problem of heroic narratives is that they tend to paint dichotomous depictions that render a complex and rich environment superficial. They often em emphasize the extreme ends of the spectrum rather than the multicolored variations, which makes this spectrum so interesting. 
Thus, we miss the drama of two Jewish, Jewish ideologies, two Jewish cultures star struggling to gain support, and perhaps more importantly, the individuals who were caught in between, who worked to define their own identity in this complex environment. Today, I wish to examine the thoughts and ideas of such people, people who took part in preserving the traditional rabbinic culture, and yet engage with Marxist ideas. I, sti I will start by reviewing the, the source that... We changed the microphone. Just... Okay. So I can... Oh, you can hear yourself? I can hear myself. Okay. But to... Oh, okay, yeah. You can hear me now? You can hear me now. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I will start by reviewing the sources that reveal these rarely heard ideas and thoughts and the, uh, and the person who brings them to us, Rabbi Shmuel Alexandrov. The second part of the lecture examined the, the thought of young Elter Hilevitz as it reflected in his letters to Alexandrov. And the third will, will analyze Alexandrov's correspondence with the, rab with the Ukrainian Rabbi Avraham Yosef Gutman. So, um, do you see? I'm the only one that have this box. You see the PowerPoint? Okay, I'm sorry. So, so we don't we don't have a lot of sources dealing with religious Jewish thought from the early Soviet Union. These untold stories I will discuss momentarily are revealed to us in a rare collection of letters that made it out of the early Soviet Union. Letters by the maverick thinker Shmuel Alexandrov. Alexandrov is a fascinating figure who placed a high va value on letters. After the 1917 revolution, he lived in the Belarusian city of Babruisk and emerged as a figure to whom the communal rabbis and yeshiva students from across the Soviet Union turned to with their philosophical queries. Unfortunately, we don't possess the letters sent to Alexandrov, but only the letters he sent in response, which sometimes contain quotes and sometimes long quotes from the letters he received and from the letters he received and convey some of the recipient's worldview. Alexander wanted to publish those letters, written between 1926 and 1921, I'm sorry, 1926 and 1929, and copied them into two notebooks he then sent to Palestine. One of these notebooks was published as the third volume of his collected letters, titled Mikhtavei Mechkar Uvikoret, or Letters of Inquiry and Critique, published in Jerusalem in 1932. The other notebook was never, never published and remains in manuscript form. You can see it on the right side of your, of your screen and also on the background of, of some of the, uh, of the, of the PowerPoint. The cons a considerable part of these letters were sent to, to two Ukrainian rabbis, Rabbi Avraham, Yosef, Rabbi Avraham Yosef Gutman, a communal rabbi in Pavlograd, and Rabbi Itzhak Isaac Silchikov, rabbi of several communities in and around Poltava. Both rabbis turned to Alexander with queries as to what a religious leader should do in these trying times for the divine purpose of such radical breakdown of traditional life, and if there is any point at all to continue to fight for what seems to be a lost cause. Alexander responded in a surprising way. Rather than stressing the importance of personal piety, he advised his colleagues not to lecture about halakha observance at all but rather on Judaism's lasting values and ethics. Only that, he claimed, can stand in the face of Soviet propaganda. Only that can serve as the foundation for a new kind of Judaism. As part of bringing this kind of Judaism into being, Alexander harshly attacked the mainstream rabbinic institution, especially on what Alexander saw as a fixation with religious commandments that benefited the rabbinic establishment financially, such as mikvaot and certain standards of kosher of kosher meat. Dabinet, and I quote, more materialist than the communist. In his sermons, he spoke against, and I quote again, that's from one of his letters, though, against those guardians of practical religion who are far from any sense of true belief. Only because of them has religion deterior, deterior, deteriorated, I'm sorry, as, as all can see how these holy mice strive only to collect their breadcrumbs. End of quote. To, the countering motion to this negation is the examination and reformulation of Judaism's core religious values. If there is any hope to turn, to turn the, back the tide of secularization and fight Soviet propaganda, 
Alexandro claimed, there is a need to modernize and reshape the core of Jewish religion. There is a need for a new theology that does not deny the break of old religion costumes and beliefs, but aspires to create new ones from the ruins of the old. For Alexandrov, one only needs to look around and realize that halachic Judaism is already gone. There is no reason to think it would ever reestablish itself, and no point in trying to do so. It does, it does not mean that, the, that religious Judaism should be abolished, but rather that it should change. This is how Alexandrov puts it in a letter to Rabbi Krasilchikov. Practical, and I quote, practical Judaism will not be able to go back to what it was, simply because it, it is almost depleted. Have our eyes darkened to see that there is no soundness in it from the sole of the foot onto the head? But spiritual Judaism is God created and thus eternal, and it is that Judaism that we should fight for. End of quote. As you can see, Alexandrov was an unorthodox thinker, and those who wrote to him expected unusual answers, which may explain some of these letters' radical nature. Sometimes the letters' recipients presented, presented themselves those unusual notions. Such is the case of a collection of, of, <clears throat> of, the, of, the, of a collection of letters by the, the, fo the focal point of the second part of my lecture, Elter Hilovitz, then a student at an at an underground yeshiva and the Belarusian State University. Raised in a Hasidic family, Hilovitz was later renowned as a rabbinic historian of Jewish law. That, however, was not until after he left the Soviet Union for Palestine. Before and, he was a young student who sought to combine Chabad dialectic theology with Marxist philosophy. We may never fully understand Hilovitz's thought from the 1920s, as we do, do not have any of his writings from that time. All we have is Shmuel Alexandrov's letters to him, letters containing fragments where Alexandrov is quoting parts of Hilovitz's letters. On the very first letter, we find Hilovitz trying to convince Alexandrov that Marxism should be celebrated as the next Jewish stage, but not necessarily a secular stage. This is how he puts it, and please note the Kabbalistic language he uses. And I quote, Judaism has been now expanded and, it's, and, and in its essence, can no longer limit itself to, the, to an abstract ideal that floats in the world of Atsilut and takes no substantial form in physical reality. Like its crea creator, it must manifest itself even in physical reality. Why should we seek to undermine the foundation of historical materialism if it is indeed a Jewish phenomenon? For Hilovitz, Kabbalistic theology and Marxist philosophy are but two sides of Judaism, whose power derives from, from it being a monistic philosophy that combines spirit and matter, that in, and in which no part of reality, whether the mundane non, nor the sublime, is excluded from or reduced by it. It is thus no accident that Hilovitz uses Kabbalistic language to defend historical materialism. For him, historical materialism took the Hasidic worldview of Chabad to its logical conclusion. If God is indeed one, if his presence is everywhere and in everything, then there is no difference between stating that everything is matter or stating that everything, and, or that everything is spirit. It is all but one substance, which manifests itself in every part of reality. Hilovitz himself felt deeply connected to this to that substance, and that he could not limit himself to preferring one side of reality over the other. He thus wrote to Alexandrov, my soul cannot bear any contraction, for its root and source are in the boundless, endless, infinite, prior to any contraction. If it engages with matters of the contracted ones, this is only because through engrabbing itself in these things, it will ascend to its general root that does not know of any division of worlds but only absolute boundless unity. Throughout this illumination, all contractions are rendered null, for they only exist in relation to those who are themselves in a state of contraction. The holy sparks within them, which descended in the shattering of the vessels in the aspect of parting branches, will ascend to their source and root within the absolute boundless unity." End of quote. As you can see, for Hilovitz, Marxism and Kabbalah 
or in this case Chabad theology, are not opposite position, but two sides of the same coin, as I said. Two sides of the same monistic entity, the source of life and existence, an infinity that Hilovitz felt especially related to. This self-assurance did not last, however. After Alexander responded to these ideas in a fury, condemning Hilovitz's ideas as heretical and opposed to, the, to what he called Judaism's spiritual nature, so to speak, the correspondence broke down soon after. The fragments I discussed and a few more are the only sources we have at our disposal in trying to piece together Hilovitz's worldview in those years. When he left the Soviet Union, he left those notions behind. And there's no mention of them in his later writings. Without Alexander's letters, we would have never learn, learned about them. As I come to the first part, to the third part of my lecture, I want to return to the world of communal rabbis from Soviet Ukraine. And to focus on one rabbi I already mentioned, Rabbi Avraham Yosef Gutman, then a, a communal rabbi in Pavlograd. Alexandrov's correspondence with, with Gutman is a, the longest and most detailed series of letters from Alexandrov's Soviet period. It starts in a point of crisis when Rabbi Gutman is considering resigning his communal post. Explaining the motives for this decision, Alexander brings up a moral question. Why is it morally justified to continue to hold a rabbinic position in a shrinking community? Only a naive rabbi, as Gutman, pu as Gutman puts it, can believe that every mitzvah he makes and every, every sermon he gives have a dramatic effect. One has to be blind not to see that religious Judaism has no future under the Soviet regime. A rabbi who is not naive needs to ask himself if he is not cynically maintaining his position only to make a living, sometimes on the expense of an old and poor community. In this claim, Goodman affirms a common Soviet trope, accusing rabbis of, of exploiting their flock, revealing that the challenge of Soviet propaganda was not merely a political and social one, it was a challenge that brought into question the moral basis of traditional rabbinic leadership. Alexander responded to that challenge with a radical individualistic theology, claiming that Gutman should see the aforementioned naive rabbi in a new, in a new light, and that such a, pers a person who stands firm in the face of devastation can bring about a new Judaism. This is how he, explained it. he explains his position. Since the divine is infinite, there is no difference between <clears throat> how one man is measured relative to the divine and, and how a whole world with all its creatures is measured relative to it. Both are finite, facing infinity. The Talmudic phrases, the whole world was created for me and the whole world exists in the merits of one righteous man, are not empty words. They possess a real meaning. Devote believers and honest religious philosophers can sense that meaning. This doctrine has a solid base in the theory of the individualists in general in, and in Nietzsche's not theory of the Ubermensch in particular. That is the doctrine of Judaism in all its various aspects throughout history. According to it, God can destroy many worlds and create better ones, assisted by the Ubermensch or Adam Elion, Adam Elion who survived the upheaval because the Ubermensch works with God to create the world." End of quote. Alexander refers to Friedrich Nietzsche's notion of the Ubermensch, but other letters reveal another source of, of influence of, for these ideas, that of the Russian God-seekers. The God-seekers were, were a heterogeneous group of Russian Orthodox thinkers who, among other ideas, gave a religious interpretation to Nietzsche's individualistic atheism. Following Vladimir Solovyov, perhaps the most important mystical Russian thinker in the late 19th century, thinkers such as Nikolai Berdaev and Dmitry Merezhkovsky sought to combine Nietzsche's Ubermensch, or what they called the Chilavek Bog, meaning the godly man, with the Christian Bogo Chilavek, or the humanly God, which they saw as, as the two sides of Jesus Christ. Alexandrov, who, was, who very much appreciated this branch of, of Russian Orthodox philosophy, is implementing these ideas into a Jewish philosophy in order to handle the challenges of the early Soviet Union. If we go back to the paragraph, we can see 
we can see that Alexander expect, ex accepts the fate of, rabbin, of the rabbinic culture. It is doomed. God is bound to destroy the world as we know it. But he is also planning to create a new one. From other passages, we learn that Alexander means a new religious world with new theological and philosophical beliefs. Every single believer may play a crucial role in molding this world. Such a believer will be a co-partner of God, or a co-creator, if you will. Therefore, Alexander tells, tells Gutmann, you should not despair and not leave your rabbinic position. You should continue as if everything you do, every child you teach is essential in shaping this expected new world. Alexandrov's initial response led Gutmann to postpone his decision to leave his position, and the conversation between the two continued until Gutmann revealed the depth of his relig religious crisis. Still holding his rabbinic position, Gutmann confessed to Alexandrov that he no longer believed in God at all. He wished to believe, but his, but his perception of reality no longer allowed him to do so, as, re as the rational truth seemed to lie with Marxism's the atheistic philosophy. I'm sorry. Unlike his response to Hilovitz, Alexander did not condemn Gutmann as a heretic. He answered with a surprising suggestion. Make yourself a god to follow with your own powers. Make yourself a god and worship him. Alexandrov then uses several Kabbalistic sources to strengthen his assertion that Gutmann, or the Ubermensch, has the power, and I quote, to be a creator of God, so to speak. End of quote. The phrase, so to speak, is, of course, significant. Alexandrov never doubted the existence of a metaphysical God that human beings could never know completely. But he, encourages, he encouraged Gutmann to transcend the image of the traditional God and to create a new image. For him, God's revelation in the world was always a product of human creativity, and thus his new image would be just as valid as the old one. If we just mentioned the God seekers, this aspect of Alexandro's philosophy could not be understood without acknowledging another school of contemporary Russian philosophers, the Marxist God builders. Thinkers such as Anatoly Luncharsky and Maxim Gorky argued that a new god created by man can carry the weight of messianic aspiration and lead humanity to a Marxist revolutionary redemption. As in the case of Hilovitz, we find that Alexandrov is knowledgeable of contemporary philosophy and implementing Christian and Marxist ideas into his Jewish thought. As I conclude my paper, it is worth no pointing out how temporary this time was. By the mid-1930s, Gutmann and Krasilchikov left the rabbinic positions, and Hilovitz immigrated to Palestine. In all publications regarding those three, there is no mention of heretical or Marxist beliefs. They do not fit the heroic narrative of a firm opposition in the face of persecution. I wish to suggest that even a sympathetic portrayal of these figures one that views them primarily as victims of anti-religious persecution, does not do justice to Gutmann, Hilovitz, and Alexandrov's ideas. Yes, we can look at Gutmann with compassion as a believer who struggled to find peace in time of great crisis. We can also view Hilovitz as a confused young man seeking to find his way against the, a current of different conflicting ideas. But in doing so, we would be guilty of imposing upon them our own narrative, a narrative in which Hasidism and Marxism, heresy and religious belief are mutually exclusive. This is not the way they experience matters. At the time, Hilovitz denied that he lived in two contradictory, contradictory world, worlds. And so Hasidism and Marxism is two sides of the same coin. Alexandrov, too, believed that one could be a believer and a heretic at the same time. Ignoring such possibility and viewing them only with compassion reduces their experiences and ideas to our particular outlook. To me, doing so is not only missing the beauty and complexity of a truly radical and innovative period of Jewish thought, it also means overlooking the everyday experiences and, and queries that shaped this unique period in Jewish social and intellectual history. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Saki, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, no questions, no comment. Oh, okay, okay, Katarina. Uh, yes, I had, <clears throat> thank you very much <laughs> for the very interesting perspective of some um, rabbinical and Hasidic ideas. Uh, this is not a question, it's a comment uh, about that idea uh, on Ubermensch uh, and Adam Elion. I have noted something similar in <clears throat> uh, in a book by Hilary Zeitlin about Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, who also indicates this parallel between uh, uh, Kabbalistic ideas, but not about Adam Elion. Uh, uh, he speaks about Tzadik, uh, and he also uh, insists that uh, uh, this teaching of Tzadik as a, as a Ubermensch uh, is very natural to uh, Breslov Hasidism, and it has sources in uh, the, the circle of ideas uh, connected to, to Nietzsche. So thank you very much. That was very interesting. Yes, uh, thank you. It is uh, 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 maybe a, 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 an element of, of early 20th century Jewish thought that we can we can see. And what I always want uh, to to pursue is to understand precisely what is the uh, what are the influences on people like Alexandrov or like uh, Hillel Zeitlin, which sometimes can be misleading because they're talking about Nietzsche. As we saw in the example of Alexandrov, he talks about Nietzsche. But from other writings, especially those in manuscript, we know how influenced he is and how impressed he is by a person like Nikolai Berdaev or, or Vladimir Solovyov. And considering they, they didn't live in Germany and they for the most part, didn't read German sources. They read Russian and Polish and other languages uh, sources. So it's always interesting to me what exactly is, are the source of, of influence. And I, I think that we can ask ourselves about Seidlin uh, uh, as well. What exactly is he refer? Is he is he taking it strictly from Nietzsche, which we know he read, which is not. Uh, uh, precisely the case with Alexandrov, or is there some mediators in between that, that, that help him uh, uh, get to this position? Uh, what I said is that we do find it in this element in, in early modern, in early Jewish, in early 20th century Jewish thought, but we, we have to, what I think requires more research is exactly what the influences on People like Alexandrov and Hilovitz are, because sometimes they can be misleading. They can there can be medi mediators, and they reading about Nietzsche in the writings of people like Solovyov or, or Berdaev. In in Alexandrov's notion, we know exactly what it is. I think that in in Hilov in a cycling uh, uh, notion, it's a bit more tricky because we do know he read. Um, he read Nietzsche from, from source materials, but that doesn't mean that there is no uh, more context to it because we all read materials in context, right? So that's my, that's my point. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you, Katya. Th th thank you, Tsaki. So any more questions? OK, we move to the last presentation. Uh, Rachel Manekin, The Making of the Galician Muscle, The Forbidden Books in Joseph Pearl's Library. Please, Rachel, okay. welcome. Thank you very much. Okay. The Galician educator and writer, Joseph Perel, is well known today for his anti Hasidic satire, The Revealer of Secrets, which is also the uh, name of this conference, but he was also known in his days for his extensive library, which he bequeathed to the school he founded in uh, Tarnopol, Ternopil. In Solomon Judah Rappaport's eulogy for Peril, we learned that the library included rare books in Hebrew, as well as in other languages, which could scarcely, which could scarcely be found even in single copies in the country or in the monarchy. Thanks to Perel's gifts, 
give to Heights Rappaport, those books could now be enjoyed by anyone who visited the school library. Rappaport emphasizes that Carol was known to be a God-fearing man, a man who never in his life transgressed even the lightest commandment of rabbinic origin. This was obviously a comment on the fact that many of the books were not rabbinic texts or even in Hebrew. Philip Friedman in his article on Perel as an educational activist estimated Perel's library to contain some 4,000 volumes. Klausner went so far as to suggest 8,000 volumes, a figure that Friedman thought unlikely. Although some of the manuscripts in Perel's library were recovered, we don't have a list of the book titles in his library, neither of the Hebrew books nor of books in other languages. Moreover, unlike such Galician Maskilim as Judah Leib Mises or Nachman Kohmal, who incorporated in their writings references to many non-Jewish titles, Perel, as far as I know, does not mention non-Jewish titles in his work or works. Yet a recently discovered list of some of his books, those which were forbidden by the Austrian censor, provides us with a glimpse into Perel's broader cultural world. Today, I will summarize some of the books on the list, those that help us understand the literary and cultural background of the author of The Revealer of Secrets. I will close with the broader implications of the discovery of this list for understanding the cultural milieu of Galician masculine, such as Perel. Under what circumstances was the list of Perel's forbidden books? Uh, 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 under what circumstances was the list of Perel's forbidden books drawn up? On July 11, 1839, Perel left instructions in his will, according to which his vast library would be transferred after his death to the primary school that he established in Tarnopol. And indeed, according to the archival file. A few months after Perel's death, 1,226 books in Hebrew and 1,509 books in other languages, mostly German, were transferred to the school's library. It is not clear whether this was the whole collection, or whether prior to his death, Perel had given some of his book to his son, Michael Perel, or other people. What is clear, however, is that Perel had not given any thought as to the fate of those books in his library that were forbidden according to the Austrian censorship regulations. Private individuals were not supposed to keep such books without permission, and books in public institutions, especially schools, were subject to much stricter supervision. Since an 1821 provincial directive granted Perel School a status of a public school, the Galician censor Ignaz Kankofer examined the collection to make sure that it did not contain forbidden books. After the examination, he prepared two separate lists. One included over 100 forbidden books in Hebrew, and the other a similar number of books in German and some other languages. The lists were not written down very carefully. Some of the titles were abbreviated and only a small number included full bibliographical data such as names of authors or dates of publication. Uh, they were then sent to Michael Perel, who was the director of the school after his father's death and was given two options, to sell the forbidden books abroad or to deliver them to the censor office, to get rid of them in other words. Michael Perl tried to fight this decision, and in a letter he wrote on May 20, 1842, so about three years after his father's death, he pleaded with the Austrian censor, uh, with the, uh, central Austrian authorities in Galicia to allow the school to keep the collection intact. As for the Hebrew titles, Michael Perl noted that they were all either Kabbalistic or Sabbatian books which he claimed were the two sources of Hasidism or Hasidic books. Those books, he explained, were used by his father for his work, Uber das Wesen der Sekte Hasidim, on the essence of the sect of Hasidism. 
obtaining all of them required at the time much effort, that's what he wrote, and many expenses, while now their work abroad was very low. Even those books, uh, even if those books were dangerous, their existence in, in an institution that is supervised by the state would help alert the youth to the bad influence of such books. In any event, Perelson's, Perelson added, those books were prevalent among individual Hasidim in libraries of Batei Midrash and in Hasidic prayer houses where they are available to all, young and, all, and old, without any type of supervision. The books in other languages, added Michael Perl, included literary classics by Voltaire and Rousseau, as well as historical literature, books on religion, culture, and the status of the Jews. The importance of such books for a Jewish educational institution was indispensable. They would be instrumental in teaching the young to recognize false trends and deviation from Judaism, as well as to point to the dangers awaiting them in the outside world. Michael Perl concluded his petition by promising to use the books only in accordance with the censorship regulations regarding schools. Public libraries were indeed allowed to provide forbidden books to scholars or high officials who asked for permission. But on February 22, 1843, Michael Perl was informed that the library of his school in Tarnopol was not a public library, and as a result, he would not be able to keep those books. As it turned out, only libraries of gymnasia and universities were under the category of public libraries and not those of primary schools. But Michael Perl's uh, uh, petition uh, did not result in a total failure since the authorities agreed to let the school keep those books in the least severe censorship category, namely books that uh, pa patrons needed to present a formal letter allowing them to read them. There were 26 such non-Hebrew titles, while those were described as strictly forbidden, including 64 non-Hebrew titles. In addition, there were also nine titles on the non-Hebrew book list uh, that were unfamiliar to the censor. I will discuss here some of the forbidden non-Hebrew books. The largest group included includes books dealing with religious orders, sects, and secret societies. There are about 10 anti-Jesuit books, some of them in the form of satires. Joseph Perl was familiar with Jesuits simply because there were many of them in his hometown, Ternopol. After being outlawed in Austria in 1773, many Jesuits left to the Russian Empire. In 1820, they were allowed to return, initially only to Galicia, in order to help setting up a network of schools there. Since Ternopol was close to the Russian border, Jesuits settled there first, establishing in the city a theological college. After only two years, it numbered 400 students, making their presence in Ternopol quite noticeable. Moreover, the Jesuits also established a gymnasium in the city, and since it, was, since it was the only gymnasium in Tarnopol, uh, Jewish graduates of Perl School continued their studies, their studies in the gymnasium in growing numbers, an arrangement displeasing its Jesuits director. The anti-Jesuit works included in the list, Blaise Pascal's provincial letters to the, uh, on the moral doctrine and politics of the Jesuits in German translation. Like the revealer of secrets, this is a, an epistolary satire written originally under a pseudonym. Pascal himself, a Jansenist, at, uh, attacked the Jesuits' moral laxity and methods of study. Beyond the value of the book as a theological essay, it has also been recognized as a literary work. Pascal remained faithful to religion, but sought to cultivate a more ration, rational version of it. Another essay on the uh, Jesuits written in an epistolary form is Das Evangelium des Jesuiten from 1822. The book is written as a series of letters by a young artist who completed his studies in a Catholic country sent to his friend, a Protestant clergyman, 
who feared the influence of the Jesuits on his friend, the artist. As it turned out in the book, the individual trying to influence the young artist is a stupid Jesuit priest who often quotes various doctrines from Jesuit literature. These quotes are, of course, ridiculed by the author. There are also several works from the late 18th and early 19th century by Peter Philip Wolff, who uh, has recently been described as one of the leading members of the Catholic Enlightenment in Germany, and who wrote extensively against Jesuits. He accused them of suppressing the common sense of the masses and leading them, leading them to Schwermerei, religious enthusiasm, and to superstition. One of Wolf's essays uh, on the censor list is a history of the Jesuits in four volumes. Another anti-Jesuit essay is a demo demagogy of the Jesuits, as can be learned through their own writings. This is part of the title. Published in 1826, reminiscence of what Perel says uh, uh, in the title of his essay on the essence of the sect of Hasidim. Another essay in this group, uh, there is written Spiegel from 1828. The book presents a history of the Jesuit order as a detailed calendar in which each event appears next to the appropriate date. It seemed that a large number of Jesuits in Tarnopol aroused in Perl a curiosity about their history. And in addition, I'll just mention in parentheses that Hasidim were sometimes uh, were compared to Jesuits. The title on sects and secret societies uh, in the list of forbidden books include an essay and what on uh, what was called animal magnetism or mesmerism from 1818. This is a German translation of a book published in Holland and deals positively with mesmerism. Its various chapter discussed Anton Mesmer, the report by the French Academy of Sciences rejecting Mesmer's attempt presented to it, as well as various experiments conducted by the book's author, authors. Other books in this group uh, include essays on the Freemasons. Uh, I don't have a, a slide for that, uh, such as the late 18th century multi-volume journal Freimaurer Bibliothek. It should be noted that gatherings of Freemasons were prohibited in Austria since 1785, when it was ruled that only one large per capita city would be allowed. There is also a book about the brotherhood of the Rosicrucians, the Rosenkreuzer in its nakedness from 1781, in which the author reveals the hidden secrets of this brotherhood. I want to mention here also another essay, here it is, uh, uh, the book by Siegfried Justus Seifert, a Protestant German titled Man as a Citizen, I give the title in trans English translation, Man as a Citizen in the Kingdom of God. Seifert introduced himself as King of Israel, a legitimate heir to the Kingdom of the House of David about to reestablish the Jewish state. He met with Rabbi Yaakov Ornstein in Lemberg and Rabbi Dobber Meisels in Krakow in an attempt to gain their sympathy for his plans and published a, ser a series of pam pamphlets in Polish in which he detailed his plans. He later included them in one essay and asked for the Krakow censor permit to publish it. His activities aroused suspicion and the Austrian authorities feared of what might happen if Jews would positively respond to him. When Seifert realized this, he left Galicia and in 1832, he published a German translation of his book in Mainz. Earlier, the Austrian authorities had asked Perl to look into Seifert and his works and according to his son, this was the reason why Perl labored to obtain this book. Judging from the list, Satires were clearly a genre that Perel was fond of, unsurprisingly. In addition to the once mentioned earlier, the list included a few satires on Jews, like uh, Justus Hilarius, it's a, a pseudonym, Fresh Jewish Cherries, Frischer Judenkirchen from 1827. Judenkirchen, the German word for certain gooseberries was 
apparently a favorite title for satires on Jews. Worth mentioning is also an 1804 uh, 12-volume parody of Lessing's uh, 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 Nathan the Wise, written by Julius von Voss, who was known for his anti-Jewish sentiment. The list include also a satir another satirical work, a charlatanarian by August Friedrich Kranz, the anonymous writer who challenged Mendel Moses Mendelssohn with his work, The Search for Light and Right. Charlatanarian is a mockery on many subjects, including Jews. Another book in the list uh, is the classic and famous parody of uh, Virgil's Aeneid, written by Alois Blumauer in 1784. Blumauer was an Austrian poet, author, known also for his course anti-Jesuit satires. Although it's his parody of Aeneid that earned him the greatest respect. Interestingly, Perl owned also a parody on Blumauer's parody, parody that appeared several years after the original one. Blumauer's work was but one of many of what became known as a flood of pamphlets published in Vienna during the first years of Joseph II's reign when censorship regulations were more relaxed. Perl's forbidden books included several titles of uh, those pamphlets, which I'm not going to name here. The list included uh, uh, also an anti-Catholic satire, Voltaire and Me in the Underground that appeared in Berlin in 1784. The books I've mentioned so far should serve as a reminder of the importance of the Austrian Enlightenment, except the last one, for understanding the Galician Haskalah. Unlike the philosophical Enlightenment of Germany, France, and Great Britain, the Austrian Enlightenment referred to in recent in historiography also as Reform Catholicism was more moderate, pragmatic, and enforced from above. Another group of books in the list deals uh, with the status of Jews and the question of their emancipation. Here we can find Friedrich Buchholz, Moses and Jesus, which was written as a polemic against Mendelssohn's portrayal of Judaism. Rejecting Judaism's relevance in the modern period, Buchholz asserts that only Christianity makes universal claims. Another book, another work in the list is by Heinrich Paulus, Jewish National Isolation. Paulus asserted that until Jews reject the Talmud, they, would only, they uh, could only expect to be subjects, not citizens. According to Michael Brenner, Paulus' book was, had a lasting impact on his generation. Perl, Perl owned uh, also a work by Gabriel Risser, the German Jewish politician who fought for Jewish emancipation, written as a response to this work by Paulus, as I just mentioned, as well as another book by Risser, uh, a response to the anti-Jewish pamphlet uh, against Bernard. Other books against Jewish emancipation on the list include the aforementioned anti-Jewish author Julius von Voss uh, and his book on the Hep Hep attacks in which he denied the influence of his writings on the anti-Jewish riots. Interestingly, the list includes also the famous anti-Semitic work Judenspiegel by Hunt Radowski. Several books in that category were written by Jews. For example, uh, one second. I don't have it here. Uh, Verbesserung der Juden, written by Elias Birkenstein. Raised as an Orthodox Jew and later a teacher of religion, Birkenstein claims that Jews must reform their religion and improve their morality. Another work, Written by, uh, written in 1793 uh, by a Viennese Jew, Abraham Yasunger calls upon Jews to improve their religion and embrace better education. The author praises Joseph II and emphasizes that there are no anti-Jewish decrees in Austria. This was apparently a rare book. There is also 
a German translation, I only found the English to show here, uh, of the English title, The Genius of Judaism, a work written by Isaac the Israeli, the father of Benjamin the Israeli. The book criticizes the way the Jewish religion is practiced and calls Jews to educate their children in European ways. There are a number of works in the list on the subject of history, such as a 10 volume history of the world by Karl Becker, an 18 volume history of our days by uh, August Friedrich Forer, Karl von Rotex's general history in nine volumes, Karl Gutzko philosophy of history, and the seven volume history of our time by Stralheim. There are also several titles on the subject of religion, Judaism, and Christianity. Interestingly, Perel owned a three volume work by Wilhelm Leberich de Wette, a uh, translation of the Old and the New Testament. As is well known, de Wette is considered as one of the earliest biblical critics. Philosophy was another subject of interest to Perel. Here we find the French uh, philosopher of the uh, Enlightenment, Helvetius. Uh, and his essay on the mind and its several faculties in German translation. Another one in this category is about Saint Simonism, several works by Voltaire, including Candide. Uh, most of those uh, works were in uh, German translation, not all of them. Machiavelli's The Prince, several works by Rousseau, including Emile and Julie. Uh, mentioning the French writers, I should also note uh, Montesquieu Persian uh, letters, which uh, he owned in the uh, original uh, French. In the area of literature, we find general lexicons, encyclopedia, uh, uh, other general works, many of them are multi-volume, like Brockhauser, uh, Brockhaus, 12 volume conversation lexicon. As for specific titles, the list includes such works as Abelard and Eloise in German translation and two works by Heinrich Heine. Perel apparently uh, was interested also in contemporary politics, particularly in the most recent 1831 rebellion of the Poles in the Russian Empire. There are six titles. Uh, on the rebellion, here I have uh, uh, two, okay, uh, all published in 1831. There is also a book on uh, uh, Robespierre and St. Jews, uh, as well as a German translation uh, of Napoleon's memoir from St. Helena. Why were all those titles prohibited? According to the Austrian censorship regulations, any work that contain assertions offensive to religion, including tolerated, the tolerated religions uh, against morality or Austrian authorities was prohibited. But despite the regulations, it was not difficult to find or purchase prohibited books in Austria. And this brings me to another question. How did Perl, a Jew in Tarnopol, get all his books? One option was to purchase them in one of several of the uh, several very good bookshops in Lemberg, such as uh, Pillar. You could also mail order from uh, those shops, uh, Pfaff and Kuhn and Milikovsky. We know that bookshops kept also forbidden books and at times even displayed them on open shelves. Perl could have also purchased his book during his travels and via agents in Berlin or other European cities. There were many uh, book catalogs that one could find in Galician bookshops or read about them in special weeklies devoted to the book trade. Contrary to uh, the popular image, Galician Jews were quite aware of the European literary market. Let me close my talk with some observation about the significance of this find for the study of the Haskalah in Galicia. Here, like other Galician masculine, has generally been viewed and discussed almost completely within a Jewish universe, where the fight against Hasidism was a major point of interest. The only external factor mentioned in the historiography regarding peril is a speculation that the revealer of secrets may have been based on such models 
on models such as the works by Villan and Montesquieu. Montesquieu, we saw here, and many other examples that he could have uh, used for uh, uh, this work. Nevertheless, because historians have drawn their knowledge of the period almost entirely from Perel's Hebrew literary efforts, his cultural world has been described as an exclusively Jewish world constructed around meetings and letters exchanging with other masculine. And I'm not referring here to his uh, political uh, activities against uh, Hasidim. And yet, even the relatively small sample of books, as it appears in the list of the censored books, is enough to show that Perl's cultural world was not exclusively Jewish, but much broader in scope. The authors whom Perl, uh, uh, Perl and other Galician masculine read not only sharpened their natural literary talents, and broaden their cultural world, but also deeply influence their Jewish religious worldview. When poring over his books in his library, Perel was not just a Jewish resident of Tarnopol or a school director, but a man of European culture, trying to reconcile religion and rational critical thinking. Many of the book in the list were written by similar religious and enlightened figures, whether Catholic or Protestant. Other books were written by people that challenged Perel's view, making him better informed and less naive. The uniqueness of the Galician Ascala was expressed in the integration, in connecting the two libraries, the Jewish one and the general one, into a single library. It's only the, uh, the sense of it uh, separated uh, the list. Perel's loyalty to the Jewish religion and tradition, as Scheer testified, testify did not stand in opposition to his reading essays such as those of the French encyclopedist or the translation of De Vetter's Bible. It would be therefore correct to describe the Galician Ascala and the term known in recent years uh, scholarship as religious enlightenment, a religious worldview that combined the world of Jewish ideas with the European ones, selectively of course. The struggle against Has Hasidism was but a byproduct of this combination. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just. Uh, thank you so. Uh, Rachel, 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 thank you so much for your amazing presentation. So let's check whether we have any questions or comments. Uh, sure, Martin, please. No, no worries. I'm just trying to, to, to show myself visible and uh, to connect with video. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. Uh, extremely rich and uh, also expanding the picture of Haskala and uh, a connection between Haskala and Hasidism in Galicia. And I think uh, much beyond. There is much uh, that interests me and also comparison of the Terz library to what we know about full list of 813 books by Abraham Stern in Warsaw in roughly the same period. The list was made 18, 1842 when Stern, uh, Abraham Stern dies. It's amazing to see similarities and differences. Um, and obviously Stern was relatively poor. He, he had only 800 books compared to 4,000 or something um, at first disposal. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not exactly the same. But I would like to, I did not understand why you did not speak about Hebrew books and to compare what was in non-Jewish languages and Jewish languages, how, how it compares the, those forbidden books between the two. So I would like you to, 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 to explain why. And second off, you said in the brackets about use of anti-Jesuit rhetorics by Perl and actually by Jesuit rhetorics in anti-Hasidic polemics. But I believe this is central to what, what you are saying. It's much more important than uh, actual physical presence of Jesuits in Tarnopol, uh, at least in my understanding, because it puts firmly Perl's discussion of Hasidism within the much longer context of anti-sectarian um, discussion of 18th and 19th century with him using the same tropes of anti first of Protestant anti-Catholic literature that you have traces examples of, then of Catholic anti-Jesuit literature, 
you have in Perl references to this kind of language when he's comparing the uh, Baal Shem Tov to Cagliostro, when he's speaking about Hasidic leaders as Dalai Lamas of, um, uh, of the Jewish world. So using exactly the same kind of, of, of rhetorics, which is part of the broader milieu, which is European, as you, as you are showing with those books. So um, uh, I would like you to, to refer um, how you see importance of the of, of this collection for us understanding where the, the ideas come um, because and i'm asking this more specifically in reference to what i saw on the list that you had several books which are mostly 18th century but then you had a quite a big number of polemics and satires which came after publication of megalet milin so maybe as kind of exchange among the satirists of the period. So actually it's not a, as an influence, but as an outcome of his position within. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, the great uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with the uh, Jesuits. Uh, the reason why I said it uh, uh, sort of uh, in parentheses because many of, of, of the individuals who, who compare the Hasidim to Jesuits didn't know much about Jesuits. It was important for me to emphasize that Perl was familiar with Jesuits. He saw them on the streets. He was familiar with them, familiar uh, with uh, uh, in, uh, individual Jesuits. Uh, so for him, uh, the comparison to, to Jesuits was something that he didn't just, you know, wasn't a rhetorical kind of assertion, but he knew what he was speaking about. That's why, why uh, in this uh, uh, venue, it was important for me to, to explain his close knowledge of, of, of uh, Jesuit, Jesuit. So when he compares, he knows what he, he is uh, speaking about. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with that list. Uh, I would be, I mean, I would love to, to see this list of Abraham Stern and see uh, what we can what we can find in, in common between uh, uh, these uh, uh, lists, uh, the uh, Hebrew books. Uh, first of all, uh, the list, uh, and I have I think identified about uh, eighty five percent of the books in the Hebrew Hebrew list. Uh, of course, it's written in Latin characters. The, the censor didn't know the language. I'm sure it was helped by a Jew. So, so sometimes you have to, to read it. I don't know how many times in order to, to, to understand uh, what, what the title uh, is. Now, unlike the, uh, and I'm glad you asked because it gives me an opportunity uh, to speak about the, the Hebrew list. Uh, unlike the, the books, the, the list of the non-Hebrew books, the list of the Hebrew books, uh, has like uh, three columns, uh, the title of the book, then Shver uh, Marai, and then Kabbalah. So every book, it was like marked as Shver uh, Marai or, uh, or uh, uh, Kabbalah. Uh, it has uh, uh, some famous uh, 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 Sabbatian uh, works. I can give you some, uh, some uh, uh, and his son mentioned it. Uh, interestingly, one of them he was allowed to keep called Shabtai Tzvi. I don't know uh, which uh, uh, book uh, it is. Of course, he has Chemdat Yamim, Meorot Tzvi, and similar uh, books. Uh, what is also interesting is that some of the volumes uh, he has like uh, four copy, uh, a few copies of, which, and I'll give in a minute example. Uh, and uh, uh, I think he had several editions. For Likutei Moharan, he has four, uh, four copies. Sipurei Moharan, and it's interesting that it's, it's in the list. Uh, Eshver Marai, by the way. Sipurei Moharan, there are uh, two copies. Kitsur Likutei Moharan, there are three copies. Uh, Shifchei Abesh, three copies. Shifchei Ari, uh, two copies. Uh, two copies of the Zohar, uh, Likutei Amarim, uh, two copies, uh, Tikkun Abrit, just one copy, uh, Toldot Yaakov Yosef, uh, uh, two copies, Tikkunei Zohar, two copies. Interestingly, 
uh, Sefer Hasidim, the, the uh, censor adds that he doesn't, is not familiar with that book, which already uh, Sahar Mazov uh, had it, uh, had this uh, uh, Sefer Hasidim uh, in, in, his, in his list. Uh, for uh, Kabbalah, the uh, Sefer Yetzira, also the Zohar, uh, Shifchei Hari, uh, uh, Raziel, uh, and what about anti-Christian literature? Is there any? In the, uh, not Hebrew, no. The Hebrew, all the Hebrew uh, uh, works, they're all either uh, Hasidic or Sabbatian under the category of Shvermarai or Kabbalah. Those are the only uh, uh, the only uh, titles in in the list, uh, uh, and there there are books I have to talk to people that I'm not familiar with, like. Darke Tzedek, three copies under the category of Shvermarai. So, uh, uh, so there are some in that list that, I, that I'm not, uh, uh, not familiar with, I have to say. I can name a, a, a few other, like Nahrat Shimon, I don't know what it is. He had two copies, Shvermarai, I don't know uh, what it is. So, uh, uh, Mizbeh Hazahab, Kabbalah, so it needs a lot more, a lot more. I mean, I've been working on that for years, but I think finally this year, I'm going to publish it and do some, and, and consult with people who are more uh, familiar with, uh, with these titles. So basically, Sabbatian books, Hasidic books, and uh, most of them are Hasidic books and some volumes of uh, Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic books. So I don't know if I answered all your questions, but uh, yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Are you satisfied, Martin? I'm very happy to hear it. <laughs> Thanks. So a few more questions. OK, so the next question comes from Sophia Korn, please. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for um, the speech, for the lecture. For, uh, what similarities between uh, Jesuits and uh, Hasidim were found? Uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, Martin, you want to answer that? Uh, uh, briefly, there was, um, it was um, rooted in the same anti-sectarian accusations and the basic accusation was that like and Jesuit Hasidim are establishing secret societies in which they make a plot against wider society that they have objectives and goals that are anti-social and are trying to control the, the world by its very typical secret society rhetorics that are trying to control the, the, the world around them by establishing secret societies. Uh, yeah, and, and who in the masses? I mean, leading the masses uh, astray, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but ben Benjamin, are you here? Yes, yes, sorry, I had, I had, to, call. I had to stop. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, here I am. Uh, thank you, Rachel. It was really very interesting. Uh, I uh, just wanted to ask a question, uh, say kind of Shirat uh, Kfira. Uh, especially in view of what you said now about having more than one copy of certain books. Uh, let's return to that. Is it clear that all the books that Pearl had are books that Pearl actually read? Uh, because uh, the fact that he has more than one copy manifests that actually he doesn't need two copies to read a book. But not only that, uh, we, I, do you have any clue that uh, he read French, for example. Some of the books, uh, at least one I uh, remember now, was, was in French. Did he know French? Did he speak French? Did he read French? But even more than that, I think mm -hmm. the, the most basic question, I'm not a Pearl expert, but whoever reads Pearl, I think he's one of the mm -hmm. least philosophical writers among the Maskilim. Uh, most of the Maskilim had broader philosophical education or at least knowledge with philosophy, general philosophy than him. He's much more concrete and as you said yourself, much more Jewish. So to what degree can we say, uh, to what degree of certainty can we say that these books were actually there for reading and not for other purposes, such as for serving the public or such as 
books that he got as presents or something. I don't know. Uh, uh, because uh, sometimes the book do tell us something about the broader or, 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 or narrow horizons of, of their owner, but sometimes, sometimes they do not. Uh, th thank you for your questions. Uh, your good questions. As for the uh, uh, volumes that he had, uh, several copies, those were only uh, Hasidic, Hasidic books. Uh, I mean, Shifchai Abesh, obviously, uh, I mean, it's clearly he read all those books. So I think having a few copies uh, meant that he had uh, uh, several editions. Uh, the non-Hebrew books, he, he didn't have like, uh, you know, multi-copies of, of, of the titles. Uh, did he read all these books? I mean, uh, I, I don't know how many books I have in my library that I intended to read. And I just looked at them and never got to it. So clearly he was a bibliophile. He wanted to put his hand on many books. I'm sure there were some books uh, that he didn't read. Uh, having books in uh, uh, you know, the Persian uh, letters, could he read? Uh, could he read Montesquieu in the, in the French original? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, but he just wanted to to have it. It's like as as something that he that he admired. He heard about. Maybe he also had a, a German uh, translation. Most of the and it's it just a list. The list. Uh, he had over fifteen hundred uh, titles uh, in non-Hebrew languages. Most of them in German. The list has just a little over a hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, even uh, sometimes we just w w want a book as a, uh, as a sort of a, an object that, that uh, we, we admire. <laughs> so uh, actually it doesn't tell us necessarily about his broader or narrow horizons, but rather about his aspirations or self-perception to some degree or se self, uh, uh, I know how to call it, the, the kind of image he wanted to transmit to the outside to some degree. The German books, the German titles, you know, we speculate here. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I may speculate, I'm sure he read, at least uh, he perused through the pages, knew what, it, uh, what it's about. Uh, but uh, I see it, it's not so uh, important uh, how much he read, which book, he, but the, the types, the genres of books that were important for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had history and religion and, and politics and, and literature. Uh, so uh, rather a, a broad kind of, uh, uh, of, of a literary kind of uh, uh, collection. And of mm -hmm. course, we, we know that, uh, uh, you know, other Maskilim uh, came to him, they borrowed book from him. Just sitting in that type of library was uh, yes, yes. a pleasure with all those fantastic books uh, around it. But again, I think that he read most of the uh, the German the German uh, titles. The fact that uh, we don't it's not reflected uh, in in his uh, uh, you know written works. Uh, I, I don't think it's it for me. Uh, I don't think we can draw conclusion. Uh, from that. It, it's like, uh, you know, a sort of, he has his, his books and then he has his, uh, his, uh, his library. And mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, that's my, <laughs> as I said, we can only speculate, uh, speculate. <laughs> yeah. Fine, thank you. Yeah. Thanks again for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Benjamin, for your question. Um, any other questions? We still have we have a few minutes. Maybe. Yeah, so I want to take the, the opportunity yeah. for uh, uh, to to present uh, the the stock uh, uh, for all those who participate here in the conference. So thank you. Mm -hmm.